गंगे च यमुने च गोदावरी सरस्वती कावेरी नर्मदे सिंधु जलस्मीन सन्निधम कुरु जल ईश्वर स्वरूप है सौम्य शालीन जीवनदायक प्रकृति का दिया ये जल रूपी वरदान पृथ्वीवासियों के लिए सिर्फ एक विरासत नहीं बल्कि एक जिम्मेदारी है जिसे आने वाली पीढ़ी के लिए संभालना आवश्यक है और इस उद्देश्य की ओर पूरी निष्ठा से कार्य कर रहा है राष्ट्रीय जल मिशन जल शक्ति मंत्रालय भारत सरकार खेती के उपयोग में आने वाले पानी का अधिकतम उपयोग हो इस दृष्टिकोण से मंत्रालय माननीय प्रधानमंत्री जी के मार्गदर्शन में काम कर रहा है और हमने नेशनल वाटर मिशन में 20 प्रतिशत तक पानी के उपयोग में कमी लाने का लक्ष्य रखा है सतह पर जो जल उपलब्ध है उसका उचित प्रबंधन भूगर्भ के जो हमारे स्रोत हैं उनका ठीक से उपभोग हो जो पानी हम अलग अलग क्षेत्र में उपयोग में लेते हैं उसका विवेकपूर्ण उपयोग हो और उसके साथ साथ में जो पानी उपयोग के बाद में निकलता है उसका ठीक से ट्रीटमेंट हो तो हम जल सुरक्षित देश को बना सकते हैं जलवायु परिवर्तन का विशेष ध्यान रखते हुए नेशनल एक्शन प्लान ऑन क्लाइमेट चेंज के तहत नेशनल वाटर मिशन की स्थापना की गई ताकि जल संरक्षण को बढ़ावा मिले जल की बर्बादी को कम किया जा सके और राज्यों के भीतर एवं राज्यों के बीच जल का अधिक समान रूप से वितरण सुनिश्चित किया जा सके गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन एंड वॉम वेलकम टू थर्टी सेवेंथ वॉटर टॉक बींग ऑर्गेनाइज बाई नेशनल वॉटर मिशन एंड इज सपोर्टेड बाई वॉटर डाइजेस्ट we all know that for any initiative to gain importance active participation from all sectors be it government be it industry or the society is instrumental in india pertinent environmental issues like water management have seldom received the attention they deserve participation from citizen had always been limited resulting in further negligence of such issues however we have seen that last few years there had been a lot of impetus given to start mass movement for an important topic like water conservation there are several case studies like hivri bazaar we have all known since long jalgram jakhni and many many more there are a lot of initiatives being carried out by individuals carried out by organized organizations in various parts of india which are really inspiring when we talk of water conservation and uh, today we are happy to welcome our key speaker uh, ms kanupriya harish an executive director with jal bhagirathi foundation who will be sharing the work they have carried out with distressed communities in the state of rajasthan towards water conservation but before we start and hand it over to our key speaker i take this opportunity to uh, invite uh, ms devashri mukherjee additional secretary and mission director national water mission ma'am for her opening remarks over to you devashri ma'am sir thank you very much anupama ji uh, and a very warm welcome to kanupriya ji it's wonderful to have you with us today um we have been talking about and i think over the last decade or so there is growing consciousness of the importance of water for the uh, for for the sec for economic security for lives livelihoods and as well as maintenance of our ecosystems as we combat climate change we the water cycle is affected first i think this is this is well known to everybody and we are seeing changes in the water cycle which again affects the poorest and the most vulnerable first so so therefore the issue of water management and the focus on water management and bringing together communities you know all stakeholders so basically making water a people's movement water management a people's movement is possibly the only way forward to ensure water security for our country and for our planet now the national water mission in partnership with as many stakeholders who are willing to partner with us with uh, 
various ministries, with state governments, with district authorities, communities, civil society organizations, we try to implement the Jal Shakti Abhiyan. We have been doing it for, for three years, where we say, you know, before the rains come, let us prepare to conserve rainwater as much as possible. So we implement the Jal Shakti Abhiyan. This year it was launched on the 29th of March by the Honorable President of India. And the objective is that everybody comes together Two, A, it is about celebrating water, it is about celebrating monsoons in the country, but also preparing our, our dwelling, which is our country, to conserve as much water as we can so that we have available the water for a more difficult time. So this is the, this is the objective. Now, this is the what. The question is the how. And that is where these, you know, the, these interactions, these talks with people who are working in the field, who are showing us the way forward, who will share with us their strategies and inspire us with their examples. So our water talks are actually what we do to try and share inspirational stories and examples of how things are done with a much wider audience. So therefore, before, uh, you know, without any further ado, I think uh, we're all waiting to listen to Kanupriya ji. So, thank you. You're on mute, Anupama ji. Thank you, ma'am. So, like ma'am has just shared, now we'll be looking forward to hearing from our speaker, Ms. Kanupriya, uh, who had been working in the sector from past 18 years. She has worked extensively in 700, more than 700 villages across uh, uh, India, especially special focus with Rajasthan. And she has also been appointed as a member of the International Steering Committee for the 7th World Water Forum and was responsible for overseeing the planning of the World Water Forum organized in Korea. Uh, in 2015, she has also been elected as an alternate uh, uh, governor representative of Jal Bhagirathi Foundation in World Water Council. And there are many more accolades to her. But uh, now further, I would like to uh, hand it over to Kanupriya ji to share about her work and whatever has been done and taken care of by their organization as far as Rajasthan is concerned. Over to you, Kanupriya. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm extremely humbled uh, to be here and to talk about our work. Uh, I would like to thank the National Water Mission and the Water Digest for giving me this opportunity to share the work that we have done with communities in Rajasthan by reviving traditional rainwater harvesting technologies with their participation uh, to be able to create availability of drinking water for the people and their livestock. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mukherjee, again for having having uh, me here. And in fact, you were pretty much echoing the work that we do, uh, and uh, much appreciate this chance to be able to share some of the little work that we have done. Um, just a little bit to share about myself. Uh, I like to call myself a practitioner. I have spent uh, close to 18 years working with communities, living with them, staying with them in the desert helping them revive traditional rainwater harvesting structures and systems. Uh, it has been a wonderful time, a wonderful uh, opportunity to understand uh, the water problem firsthand, sit with them, sit with the communities. They exactly know how to be able to address their water problems. Uh, and it has been a wonderful opportunity where we have been able to learn from them and in a way give back to the society. In fact, it's the communities who know where the water flows, where we can harness it, where we can catch it. Uh, before I start my presentation, I'd like to share a little anecdote um, about myself and about how uh, we orient people into JBF in community management. I um, did my MPhil from JNU in Delhi. And just after that, I, when I passed out, the whole idea was to bring in a revolution, a revolution which was overnight. Um, in, in our organization, uh, we, have, we would send people 
to uh, to a village we were supposed to go there for three days without any mobile or without a money without any money we were supposed to live there survive there work with the communities understand the communities i was uh, assigned a, a program from uh, from UNICEF and I was supposed to look after 13 villages. I was fresh out of college, never been to the desert. It was, uh, it was a new area, new language. Uh, I went there and to be very honest, I was lost. I did not know what to do, where to go. It was an old man there who helped me. He helped me not only with food, he gave me a place to stay. And most importantly, he helped me do my survey. This has been a lifelong learning that and a lesson the warmth of the community the amount they have to give uh, and though so little they have and it is from here that i realized i started my journey learning from them not taking our knowledge but taking their knowledge in a participatory manner learning with the community innovating with them innovating in the traditional rainwater harvesting structures and system they had to develop them further to create availability of water. So I would say our work is not so much of reviving construction or constructing rainwater harvesting structures, but working with people and building community institutions. Uh, I, I like to call uh, the work that we do Rain for Life. Um, it is community participation, participation in water management, but basically it is rain for life. When, when I say the word rain, what does, what's the first image that comes to somebody's mind? For some, it is clouded skies, lightning, thunderstorm, fun, frolic, dancing in the rain. In fact, in the summer heat, if you look outside of the window now, it is a wait for the rain. People are waiting for the rain to come. But when the rain comes, we have news flashes that water is logged, there is, we, we are losing water, there is so much of water that can be harnessed, but we lose all the water. But probably for all the people who are listening to me now, rain does not mean life, or it does not mean water for life. But the communities that we lead, work with, rain is life. So the focus of our work is basically to capture as much rain wherever we can uh, to be able to store it to be used at a later stage, later state. To talk a little about JBF, uh, we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we are mandated to work in Rajasthan. We were set up in 2002. Uh, we have worked in about uh, 700 villages, uh, the focus of the organization is water security and sanitation, which uh, we hope is sustained by responsive governance and inclusive growth, getting everybody to work together, bringing them on a platform, which over a period of time gradually will lead to sustainable development. We sit down with communities, basically, uh, creating location-specific needs, uh, strategies, and would address issues in a way, in a location-specific manner. I'm very fond of maps, and in, in this gathering, probably I would not want to dwell too much on statistics, but this map uh, from the Niti Aayog uh, rings the red bell of danger for India. Most of India is, uh, is moving to uh, the red color, which is obviously showing that we are water stressed. Just a second, Kanupriya ji. Uh, her presentation is not visible. Yeah, Kanupriya, you're uh, supposed to start it from your side. Is it not visible? No. Yet. Okay. Yes, now it's visible. Yeah, now it's fine. Thanks. Okay, yeah. all right. Okay. Sorry. You want me to go back? Or this right. is it okay now? Hello. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. So, so um, when when I talk about I what I said was that I'm very fond of maps. Maps give you a visual of uh, the situation. 
uh, this map from Niti Aayog um, is uh, uh, is shows that India is moving more towards water stress. We are all in the red, and obviously, uh, the demand versus the supply uh, there is a huge gap. And obviously, by the 20, there are various studies. Some give a scenario of 2030. Some give a scenario of 2050. But yes, uh, whatever is the scenario, over a period of time, with the demand increasing and the supply falling, um, we are um, sitting with an impending water stress and a water scarcity area. We happen to work in the area which is uh, a very, very red area, um, Rajasthan. Uh, we work in the area that is highlighted green here. So we basically work in areas where the border districts meet. So we work in areas where Jodhpur, Pali, Barmer, Jalor, Jaisalmer, the Western Rajasthan districts meet. And we have recently, over the past three years, taken up villages around the Sambar Lake, which is the largest salt water lake in, in India, uh, along the borders of Nagor and Jaipur district. So this is exactly where we work. We are the largest state. We have extremely scarce water resources. We hardly have any surface water uh, sources. 87% of the land is drought area. In fact, for us, uh, drought is a, is a way of life. 74% villages nationwide uh, that exist, exist in Rajasthan that have water quality issues. We also do collect a lot of our own primary data and uh, the quality of the groundwater sources as well as the surface water sources um, have much in wanting. And of course, like I said, we, we are looking at various scenarios. By 2015, uh, it, it is believed that Rajasthan would be water scarce. Uh, we, it is extremely, extremely vulnerable to climate change. Uh, according to the IPCC, we are extremely vulnerable to changes both in climate variability as well as climate change. To talk about uh, where we work, it is an extremely vulnerable um, environment. We have uh, uh, dispersed populations. We have people. We have people who live uh, in different parts uh, of the states. They live between thanis. So one person lives in one location, and the other person would look, live far away within the sand dunes. It's a dispersed population, which obviously increases the challenge of uh, creating any infrastructure for water. We have a fragile ecosystem. We get severe sandstorms. The temperatures are nearly reaching 50 degrees even now. We have, because of livestock being our uh, source of livelihood, we have uh, a lot of overgrazing due to which there is land degradation. Uh, the biodiversity is threatened. Uh, the temperatures are very, very high. Uh, this is a photograph, which is one of my favorite photographs. Uh, and it is from Barmer district where uh, the camel, which is also known as the ship of the desert, uh, is tired and needs shade. But a woman, she still has to carry water, drinking water for her family to provide for her family. We have recurrent droughts, and there are various studies. And uh, a study from Kazri, uh, an institute out of Jodhpur, says that the possibility of no drought in Jodhpur is 60, 16%. A moderate doubt, again, 16% but a probability that there will be a drought is 40%. So this is, uh, so for us, drought is a way of life. <clears throat> we have no watershed, no rivulets, except for those that flow during the monsoon. We have a very, very flat, flat land. We have acute scarcity of drinking water. Again, in this photograph, this woman has scooped out a little hole from which she's collecting water. We get about 200 to 300 millimeters of rainfall, which is about say six to eight inches, our groundwater is very, very saline. Uh, probably because at one time we were the sea, uh, the groundwater is not portable. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we do a lot of water testing to train communities on safe water. And we found that the, uh, the, the total dissolved solids in water go up to 10,000 ppm. Uh, in areas around the Sambhar Lake, because probably because of the, uh, because of causes a lot of diseases. 
because of the heat, we have very high evaporation rates. So if we harvest water in open structures, yes, we have a problem of losing water. We lose about 1.8 to 2 meters of water every year due to evaporation. And we have identified those villages, we work in those areas which fall under a category of not covered by the, uh, by the government so that we can complement our efforts which means that people do not have a source of drinking water between 500 to at least 1.5 kilometers. Uh, we still um, are uh, the most densely populated desert in the world. Um, we have a population density of 100 to about 200 people per square kilometer. Uh, the Sahara has about 8 to 9 people per square kilometer. And with the population increase, uh, between uh, 2001 to 2011 being in double digits. It only shows that the stress on our water resources is going to increase manifold. What does water scarcity mean to the region? It is poor quality of life. It is a huge economic burden. People purchase water. So the average water tanker, we have, a, we have a tanker lobby here, the average water tanker cost for a 4,000 liter water tanker is about 500 to 2,000, depends on the quality of water that you're having. So they spend around upwards of 15,000 rupees uh, annually, excuse me, on, on water. Uh, it means poverty. Uh, the two main sources of livelihood in the region are uh, livestock rearing and rain fed agriculture both heavily dependent on rainfall. We have huge impacts uh, on health because of the poor quality of water. In fact, interestingly, in, in our area of water, the quality of water is, is defined by communities on it based on its taste. So we have mita pani, which is not sweet water, but portable water. We have bhari pani, which is saline, you can have it. It is not very good, but you can have it. And the third is khara pani. Khara pani is water which is salty and cannot be used for consumption. No education with obviously the girls, uh, they are the first ones to help their mothers uh, provide for water. Uh, people migrate uh, for livelihood because of not, not having livelihood within uh, the village. And, uh, but the most, most impact that happens of, uh, of water uh, is on women. This is a little uh, uh, snippet that I have taken out from our, um, our primary data collection that we do. So women on an average, they walk about five to eight kilometers every day to fetch water. And uh, if I were to uh, take the average water collecting life of a woman to be 40 years, which is again a, a very conservative estimate that I'm taking, they travel about 1,800 to 3,000 kilometers a year, and in a lifetime, about 120,000 kilometers, which means that she has traveled two to three times around the planet Earth just fetching water. We've also um, collaborated with Ames in Delhi to uh, understand what is the impact that happens on the spine of a woman when she's head loading 40 liters of water which means that the, a woman on an average spends one third of her life just walking, collecting water. Um, just a, a little thought that I would like to add is that water costs nothing for those with everything. We probably don't even look at our water bills, but it costs everything for those with nothing. So drinking water availability is the first step towards poverty eradication and in my opinion, women empowerment. With population increasing and the demand for water rising, but the source still remains finite. So obviously we are in a situation that how do we manage a resource which is finite to be able to reach people at the base of the pyramid. When I paint such a, a bleak picture, one wonders how did people survive in the desert? The Thar has been a desert for centuries. It is not that the Thar became a desert overnight. Uh, it survived because it had rich traditions of rainwater harvesting. We had our gores, which were catchment areas, huge catchment areas. We had gorchers, which were grasslands. They had uh, 
local varieties of grass called dhaman and seven which have now totally uh, totally disappeared these were very high calorific grasses which were used by which were very good for uh, the livestock and we had orans which were sacred forests all of these three were repositories of uh, biodiversity and they were able to harvest water in huge village talabs which were able to uh, meet the drinking water requirement of the people it was the people who developed and controlled these uh, water harvesting structures they had attached sanctities of principle of conservation equity as well as utilization so not just harvesting there were a lot of a uh, lot of customs and to conserve the water so for example nobody was allowed to bathe in a tala uh, is a very interesting stories have been when a, when a young girl was married into the village she was first taken to the village talab so to for her to be paying the obeisance so there was this whole sanctity to conservation of water that was there and this was an adaptive strategy to climate change people not only change but variability uh traditional wisdom was not only there in uh, rural areas but, but also in cities uh this is a map of uh, jodhpur and jodhpur um had this intricate uh, maze of uh, water channels that carried water from one uh one water water talab to the other and finally into the city uh walking into the city of jodhpur is an amazing water walk where from the outside you would probably feel that uh it, it's a it's a building but when you go in south inside there are step wells however over a period of time uh, people have stopped using these traditional systems and we are now all dependent on the pipe water uh this is another um, very interesting step well which is again in rajasthan probably one of the most beautiful in india uh it is chand bauri in uh, in abaneri a village between on the jaipur agra highway um this uh, this um, structure is the most interesting example of how in the 8th century when it was built water was managed not just only for this village but a number of villages around so you could there was a separate entrance for animals to come and wa have water for for uh, uh for no common people to come and then obviously the maharaja to use this water however all of these traditional systems and practices are gradually falling apart so basically this is um, the problem statement and uh, and how we are trying to address it so on the left i would say is the problem statement where we have the weakening of the social capital people now do not want to work as a unit a cohesive unit there is absence of community ownership there is neglect of traditional practices and the most important is that there is dependence of the government and on centralized schemes everybody wants to um, everybody is hoping that the pipeline would once come and then we forget these practices non none of us realizing that water is a finite resource this leads to vulnerability to climate change and our approach i like to call is an enabling approach a bottom up enabling approach basically with five focus areas one is community mobilization sitting with the community getting them together understanding from them what they want and facilitating the social capital the social capital which has which had gradually faded away bringing it back together bringing them back together on the common platform of the the requirement of the day which is water and because we are looking at in situ availability of water we look at reviving traditional rainwater harvesting structures we do a lot of participatory action research the work that we've done we look at it we see how we can improve it uh, learn from it then take it back to the communities again and obviously networking and advocacy because we as an ngo uh, can only create models of replication which we hope will be carried forward to other areas Uh, by other people our uh, our community mobilization is very very intensive we identify um, our areas that we work in like i mentioned we work on border districts through 
intensive rapid rural appraisals. We sit down with the communities, we sit down with people, we do a lot of consultive community engagements, assess the need, and the most important element for us to start working in a village is the willingness of the community to work in a particular project. It has to be demand driven because they are required to contribute financially in the construction of, uh, of a project. So basically, we end up doing a lot of consultation to see if there is a need and a demand from the community. Our methodology focuses on participatory approach, create village level institutions uh, within the village, uh, identify leaders within the village who will work with the village for the development and harness the collective, collective wisdom. So basically our, our strategy promotes local technology uh, which uses local expertise. So we have the local masons who work with us, we train them, we use local materials so that it can be sourced easily and is able to be maintained once we are gone. Uh, because of this reason, people understand what we do, and that is the reason why it is popular. So it's three broad focus areas. Number one is community institutions, developing them, strengthening them through training and capacity building, community contribution, and community empowerment. When we create the social capital at the village level, we create what we call as the Jal Sabha. A Jal Sabha actually translates as a water user association. We get people from the village, we try to uh, link them with the panchayat, uh, we try to enlist panchayat members also, but we are, the, the focus is to have influencers in the Jal Sabha who can bring the community together, motivate them to come together and work. One of the most important elements is that we have representation of all communities in the Jal Sabha and also, which is very, very difficult, but also have at least 10% women who are vocal in the village to be coming and participating in the Jal Sabha. Then we have what we call as the Jal Samiti. Water, because it's a sheet flow water, rain water, uh, it go, flows from one village to the other. We, um, we create a Jal Samiti of people spread across these villages. So there is a consensus. In many occasions, the catchment is in one area, the collection structure is in the other. That's where the Jal Samiti comes in. Then we have the Jal Parishad. Uh, this is a body where uh, we have a lot of experts who work with us. We have members of the PhD, we have members of AS AFRI, Kazari, a lot of research institutions. Uh, we work with them so that whatever work we do, uh, we are able to improve it further, take it back to them, take, take guidance from them, and are able to achieve the, uh, the mandate of being able to harvest water. And finally is a stakeholders or a Jal Sansad. This is basically all our uh, beneficiaries. We meet annually. Uh, people can come and talk about their success stories or share, or in fact, um, put in proposals if they if they would like to come us for us to work in their village. Uh, we do a lot of uh, participatory exercises uh, to identify what is the need in the village. So we basically we do transact walks. We make seasonal calendars. But the three most important tools that we do are social maps, resource maps, and top topical maps. So basically, these are the maps that help us understand, give us a basic idea of a village before uh, we, dis we decide with the community in terms of what intervention we would want to take up in the village. And obviously the final intervention that we want to take up uh, is, uh, is done through focus group discussions. Uh, just uh, um, like Ma'am Mukherjee was also talking, rain is, is very, very important. And this is a little small snippet on the potential for rainwater harvesting. Uh, it's it, people think it's a it's a difficult math, but it's very easy. So I would start with a very very small rainfall of say 100 mil millimeters per year, and assuming we have an area of uh, one square kilometers, which is 100 hectares as a catchment, we uh, will be able to harvest a total of 100 million liters of water in just one rain. If it's a good good catchment, we'll be able to do that. So this is the potential. This is the amount of rain 
that we can harvest and store. We just need to be prepared to be able to create that infrastructure to be able to harvest it. So the focus of our work, wherever we sit down with communities, is to develop rainwater harvesting structures where we can harvest, uh, where, where we can maximize the water harvesting potential. Uh, we do both community-based rainwater harvesting as well as household-based rainwater harvesting. We create talabs, which are basically village ponds. They have an embankment, which, are, which is not normally uh, load-bearing. But because we do not have any watershed, most of the area is flat, we create, if you look in the foreground of the picture, we create water channels. Uh, the purpose of the water channel is to be able to quickly harvest, like I said, harvest as much water as falls. So we have a gradient uh, on a flat land of say about 5% and if the water is falling towards the end, the idea is to make a water channel so that the water comes in quickly and is collected in the tala. We make uh, nadis, which are ponds and grasslands uh, in gauchers. Uh, traditionally, uh, these were used by, um, by, by livestock rarers uh, for their livestock. They would go into the gaucher with have grass um, and have water for their livestock. Um, unfortunately, because of the population pressure, this uh, divide, this, this line has, uh, has sort of uh, um, blurred and people use uh, uh, water from both structures, people, people and animals. So these are the feeder channels uh, where basically uh, the idea is to, um, to survey the land, to understand the slope, make these feeder channels so that in one rain, two rains, we are able to harvest enough water. We do school tankas, which are underground rainwater harvesting tanks. So basically we calculate the area of the rooftop, uh, and then we uh, have a ground catchment um, or we just have a, a tank where water gets collected. We do household tanks. In this particular tank, it's just this, 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 he doesn't have a roof, so it has been calculated, the catchment has been calculated as a ground catchment. We make these rainwater harvesting tanks and then install a hand pump uh, so that water, uh, the withdrawal of water is safe. We do recharge wells. Uh, these are not groundwater wells because most of the groundwater in the area that we work is very, very saline. These are um, berries. Uh, in the common language, they are called berries. They're either made um, around sand dunes or they are made close to a talab. So basically, they have seepage water that comes in. They are very, very interesting. It is actually very clean water because um, it, it is passing through a sand filter. The water comes in during um, the night. People draw the water and by evening the water finishes. But then by morning, the water again is available. We also innovate uh, on uh, different types of rainwater harvesting structures that we see or learn about in, uh, in different parts of the world. One of them is uh, sand dams. These are dams uh, that are very, very extensively made in Kenya and they are made in dry riverbeds. Uh, the idea over here is not to collect water like in our Anicut, but to be able to collect water bearing sand. So the water seeps in and there is groundwater recharge and water is available on, uh, uh, on a longer term for the communities. So the, the, uh, the idea of the planning is to sit down and create uh, integrated water management system wherever the possibility arises. So we have a rainwater harvesting catchment. In the catchment, the water falls, and wherever required, we clean up the catchment, prepare the catchment, have feeder channels so that the water comes into a talab. We make household uh, rainwater harvesting tanks uh, with rooftop and ground catchments, as and we make these tanks also in the school. We also promote uh, construction of household toilets through, um, through mobilization uh, and have very innovative exercises um, or training, training programs to encourage people not to just create the infrastructure, but also to use them. So most of the time, uh, we are looking at how to adapt water harvesting to climate change. Obviously, the rains are so variable now. Uh, traditionally, the rains would fall over a period of time 
but now if the rains fall at one go it is very difficult for a catchment to be able to harvest that rain it gets wasted so so we adapt our structures to be able to capture the 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 rainfall and we are also reviving traditional norms of preservation so people uh, people have now start, uh, again started systems where uh, you are, uh, you cannot enter uh, the agor or you cannot defecate in the catchment area so that the water remains clean we focus on sustainability through financial models that create ownership all structures that we create have to have uh, participation of the community from 30 to 50% and the contribution has to come in, in um, it has to be verifiable transparent so we are able to see it so basically it has to be in cash uh, which can be verified post construction for community based structures uh, we encourage them to set up a progressive water pricing system so basically because we've created these jal sabhas that are uh, uh, that that come out of a lot of community consultation uh, these institutions that do not even have much of a penal jurisdiction are able to charge money from the users which then again goes back into the development and construction of the rainwater harvesting structure we do a lot of training and capacity building uh we on sanitation and hygiene uh we have structured trainings we have a lot of external experts coming we do medical camps to understand the impact of water on health uh we do clts uh to trigger sanitation uh we do a lot of we have developed a lot of iec material which is easy to understand hands on uh for for people to understand the link between water and sanitation often we go and people do not understand what is the link between sanitation and water uh we do water testing we get people to see um how the water is besides equipment we also have these very uh, very interesting exercises that have been developed for them to understand that what looks clean may not actually be clean um when we talk about um sanit uh, sanitation and hand washing um one is uh, encouraging them to use soap and in the other is that we have developed this uh, system of uh, making soap at home so it's a cold press system for making soap uh, we train women young girls uh, to make soap uh, and use it uh, for for their household uh, for their households and again to understand uh, um the rain water harvesting is not something very very technical and even in a small catchment one can harvest uh, water this is a little uh, tool uh, which is called jal chakra that we have designed so basically here it is to calculate and see how much water you will be able to harvest with a particular amount of rainfall so if you were to look at the figure 80 if the if the area of uh, of the house or the catchment is say 80 square meters and the rain follows is 300 so in one rain one rain um a person would be able to harvest 2400 liters of water this is just one fill on an average when we make our underground tank uh, it fills at least three times so with this little uh, tool um our mobilizers our communities they are all able to very quickly understand that this is how um uh, this is how much water we'll be able to uh, harvest and that's the reason how the uptake in terms of rainwater harvesting increases beyond implementation uh, we do a lot of post implementation monitoring by local mobilizers uh, we leverage and engage community into new initiatives so we do one program and then we look at how in, to engage them keep them organized and we develop community champions so basically we do not work with a very large uh, staff we have a, a volunteer base of about 20000 people they are people from the villages and we we make them champions and they are the ones who are mobilizing new villages uh, to take the work forward uh, i would like to share some case studies with you this is a talab in uh, in barmer district uh, around the pachpatra salt again a salt lake that we have rajasthan has uh, a number of salt lakes it was this this was more or less flat ground um 
here we had all women this uh, they are from the real community they came together and uh, they formed the jal sabha uh, they planned uh, the structure um, they and this is how it looked after the construction um, where um, they they made an embankment and they excavated um, they uh, raised 30% of the cost the total cost was 195 uh, 195000 rupees and they set up a pricing mechanism the women in the village set up a pricing mechanism of charging 50 rupees for 4000 liters of water uh, they were able to harvest about uh, 12000 300 cubic meters of water if i were to you know convert it into an lpcd based on the population which is of about 1000 in this village they get about 33 lpcd of water they obviously have to carry the water to their home uh, this is a very interesting village it is called gopalbari barwa uh, this uh, is a unique village because it is on the border of four districts uh, it is in jalor but it is on the border of jalor uh, barmer jodhpur and pali Uh, this is a saline well it is in the talab of the of the village um, but it had water which was saline um, uh, here again people spent um, about 500 rupees for 4000 liters of water the cost of the water all depends on the quality instead of developing the talab here uh, which um, did not have the right soil we uh, constructed a new recharge well or a berry and um here if you can see that the water actually trickles down in the berry because the subsoil water from the talab comes into the berry and then people can draw the water and use it so if you look in the background it's the talab the rain the water came, comes in but because of the soil in the in the talab which is not very good um all the water seeps in but the water seeps in and it comes out of um this uh, berry which is then used by the communities on an average uh, they get about uh, 50000 liters of water from this structure uh, the population here is at about about around 800 800 850 so they are able to get about 50 lpcd of water from this structure Uh, this is another talab uh, here um, if you look at the catchment area we obviously based on the catchment area we designed the talab it is a it's a rock it's a stone catchment area which is obviously the best catchment area because the losses of rainwater harvesting are very very low uh, it had a initial capacity uh, of 4000 cubic meters and the water retention period was only about 7 months this is uh, the um, excavation work we use earth excavators uh, so that we are able to create uh, an enhanced capacity uh, for uh, for our structure uh, this is out this is af after the rains uh, the now the total capacity is about 10000 cubic meters um, in uh, the population here that uses it is about 600 700 people who use the structure it was completed at cost of 191000 rupees again 30% of the cost came from the beneficiary community uh, this is the sand dam that i was talking about this is in uh, jalor district sand dams are very interesting technology where we go down to the bedrock so they are made in river beds that are dry there is no water we go down to the bedrock and we create what is called as a water seal So basically, we had uh, engineers come in from Kenya who helped up, helped us make these structures. We've made them in thirteen villages. We go down to the bedrock and we make a water seal with barbed wire, um, iron, and then we we bring them together. So basically, the dam has become a part of the rock. So basically, it it is rising from the rock, so that water, the sand bearing water, is collected within the dam. this is the structure of the dam it is about 51 meters long and um, if if you notice that the wings are very huge so the water the river is tamed to flow over only the the lower step um the community uh, this was a large project the community contributed 300000 rupees it was completed at a cost of about 17 lakhs uh here uh, this has resulted in the recharge of wells um about 103 wells have been recharged out of which 3 are of the phd which are used for supplying of water and 100 uh, personal wells down the 
on the downstream of the dam have been recharged. People here have started agriculture. They're, they're growing chilies uh, just after uh, being able to get water, which is, uh, which is portable and can be used for agriculture. Uh, finally, uh, the in situ availability of drinking water for each household is done through construction of underground rainwater harvesting tanks. So uh, these rainwater harvesting tanks uh, or hordes as they are called have a rooftop as well as a ground catchment to harness rain. Uh, if you look at this little structure on uh, the left of the woman, this is an open tank also known as a kacha tanka. This was her source of water where she was collecting her drinking water. Like I mentioned, we sit with the community in terms of what do they want to develop. So they wanted to um, um, dismantle this structure and create a rainwater harvesting tank. Um, the construction happened. And uh, in, in this case, we, we created a ground catchment as well as uh, we used the already existing um, pipe uh, that they had for their house as catchment area for this structure. We make three aeration chambers so that, uh, so that the water that is inside remains fresh. There is a circulation of air that is happening. The average size of these tanks that we make is about uh, 25 to uh, 30,000 liters. Um, this is, uh, they provide about 15 to 20 LPCD of water for a family of five through the year. This is only if it, is, if it fills up once. But on an average, given our uh, rainfall patterns, um, they fill up at least two to three times. So obviously, the availability of water is much more. We also test this water, the water that has been harvested, uh, and share the results with the community, uh, along with the results of the already existing uh, water sources, so that they understand the difference um, between, the quality, um, between the quality of water. Uh, again, here, um, the average cost that comes for a structure like this is about 2.25 to 2.75 uh, rupees uh, per liter. Again, uh, the beneficiary con has to contribute 30%, uh, which goes into the construction of the, um, of the structure. Uh, we install a hand pump uh, so that uh, the water that is drawn, uh, if the structure is closed, the water that is drawn is safe for use. Uh, this is a tank, a household tank, only with rooftop catchment. So if you look at the pipe behind the woman, the, all the rainwater, they, the, they do not understand that rainwater has this potential, would get wasted. Uh, they did not have any space, so we helped them uh, construct the tank within their house. Uh, it has now become a part of their house, and uh, the rooftop is now through a chamber, the water is coming in, which can now be drawn from a hand pump. Uh, we do underground uh, rainwater harvesting tanks in school with rooftop um, harvesting. So here uh, you would see all the downtake pipes that are there from the roof, uh, the building of the school, uh, which come into this, uh, which come into this tank. Um, for which, with this is the the final tank that has been constructed and because we have more than one user in a school we create water stations um, the idea of a water station is uh, because children will not probably be um, able to maintain the hand pump in this water station um, is an easier way to, uh, uh, to to take water we also because uh, though we do a lot of trainings in terms of cleaning the catchment areas before the rains, uh, but we also do trainings and link uh, our tankers with government programs where chlorine tablets are used to clean the water or basically because it's rainwater, it's all clean alum can be used to clean the water to, to get rid of the turbidity. Uh, just a little about the impacts. We've done about um, 700 villages. We've uh, constructing location-specific rainwater harvesting structures. We've constructed uh, tanks, household tanks, in more than 3,000 houses. We've constructed tw toilets in 2,100 homes. Each village that we worked in, we have a water user association or a Jal Sabha that has been facilitated and capacitated. Uh, we have a people's contribution, which comes between 30 to 50% of uh, the structures. 
norms for maintaining maintaining the community structures have community as well as how household structures have been established so people um, um and people are now engaged in preserving and protecting their water source there is a financial sustainability of jal sabhas that has been achieved because they are able to raise funds post construction from uh, from uh, people who come to take water we have had a lot of evaluations uh, these two figures that i'm quoting is from a undp evaluation that was done of our work uh, which shows that um, there is an increase availability of drinking water in about 95% households uh, and the availability of water for livestock which is their main stay livelihood of, uh, livelihood is about 80% uh we have norms for equitable distribution of water because we have people uh, who work together they are a community people live in a community everybody is everybody is able to share the water resource we finance there's a unique system of financing the infrastructure uh the fund in the village uh, that is developed for these structures is known as a jal kosh where they raise money not only for construction but for also for maintenance of those structures uh because uh water a lot of people spend a lot of money on water um uh, uh, the UNDP evaluation um showed that there was a reduction in the cost of water a nearly 140% reduction in expenditure on water uh by communities there's obviously a direct reduction in the drudgery of women because water is now closer to home they do not have to travel to get water um we were also a part of the eu state partnership program with the government of rajasthan and uh, they an evaluation of uh, the work that we had done was was under, undertaken by the eu in 2016 and they said that uh, this is a project which is highly recommended as a flagship project of water and sanitation initiatives elsewhere basically the models that we create um have the potential of being upscaled thank you very much thank you my my very much for your attention thank you kanupriya ji for your wonderful presentation and uh, uh, um, you know we generally move ahead with question answer session also so uh, ma'am if you allow shall we open for question answer session or you would like to uh, comment or share your comments here i wish you know think we should i uh, we should open it up for questions and answers all right thank you all right so uh, most of our participants are well versed with the system that how do we uh, do our question answer session still for all those who are new to the program today um, you have uh, you have an option of raising your hand so you can raise your hand and my team will uh, unmute you and you can introduce yourself and put forward your query also you can write your queries in the chat box some of you have already uh, shared your queries and i'll be taking them one by one also we are live from various uh, uh, facebook handles so from there also we are collecting all those queries which are put forward from the social media and we will be taking it up in this session so we are open for the q and a and you may raise your hand as well i request mr bashir ahmed sir you may please ask your query i request again mr bashir ahmed sir you may please ask your query I request uh, Mr. Kiri Trivedi. You may please ask your query. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, two to three questions are my in my mind. First, uh, they told that we are not uh, support taking any help from the government side. so if the government can help the society your society it will be better beneficial for the people of the villages second question uh, you talked about the step wells so my uh, just one humble suggestion if you go to regeneration the very small step wells in the villages where it is very fruitful to recharge the water uh, rainy water and the third one is uh, you told about the there are very saline waters in various places so is there any program to make a saline water usable to the resident of villages thanks madam can i respond 
Yes, 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 please. Um, I am. I am afraid. I. I don't know how it uh, came that uh, we do not uh, work with the government. We work very, very closely with the government. Um, we were have been part of all the. Um, the programs uh, for rainwater harvesting, promotion of rainwater harvesting. Uh, there has been the Mukhya Mantri Jal Swablamban Abhiyan, where we have been trainers. Uh, we work in uh, in all the uh, training and capacity building programs of the government, uh, along with the government. In fact, the Honorable Minister uh, is uh, from uh, um, from our area, and we work very very closely with him. Uh, and it has been. Uh, it has been an honor that he has uh, visited some of our projects. So I'm I'm afraid how uh, that came out from my presentation. I'm, I apologize for that. Uh, number two, uh, yes, uh, there is uh, a lot of groundwater, which is the line. And uh, uh, we have also, again, experimented. Uh, now let me be very clear about my partnerships with uh, our partnerships with the government also. We uh, did an experiment with the PHD, the Public Health Engineering Department, uh, on creating um, reverse osmosis plants that would treat the water uh, and uh, uh, people could come and collect the water. But then again, the issue was that the government was facilitating the program in terms of giving us uh, the water supply. But because of the quality being so bad, um, the reverse osmosis plants uh, were unable to handle the water. So though we have a lot of, uh, uh, we have had um, experiments, not just by us, but by but others also, um, it has been found to not be a very, very feasible option because of the costs involved. I'll also take a question, uh, which is by Mr. Uh, R.S. Tyagi. Um, it's a nice presentation by Ms. Kanupriya. It is really a commendable task for water stressed areas of Rajasthan. But to what extent uh, can it be replicated in water stressed areas of Delhi, where there is no space to construct rainwater harvesting structures in slum areas, rural and urban villages? In our single house, there are multiple ownership. However, in such areas, community-based rainwater harvesting is more doable and useful. Second, creating harvesting structure is easy, but their maintenance is not ascertained by the owner as well as the regulating authority. What is the mechanism adopted in, in, in Rajasthan to ensure maintenance of rainwater harvesting system? Um, so in urban areas, there are various other uh, options of rainwater harvesting available. Um, if you're talking about Delhi, uh, I did not talk about it here because we do not do it. But in, um, in urban areas, we do advise people to go in for injection wells which are very, very doable. They, uh, or most houses have uh, these bore wells and we have rooftop water that gets wasted. Um, it is very, very feasible for um, a household to um, collect that water and bring it back into the earth. So the groundwater in the, in the well is recharged. Um, obviously, uh, if there are if there are multiple uh, owners in a house, I'm assuming that everybody needs water. So at least uh, they it it has to come from them to pool in their resources to be able to create availability uh, of water. Yes, water harvesting uh, is not easy. Uh, it is difficult. It requires maintenance. Uh, and uh, that is the reason why um, in, uh, in my work, we, we said that we get the community involved. There is a financial stake. We are basically an enabling organization. We enable people to construct. So once they have constructed something, they maintain it. Like we maintain our houses, they maintain their source of water. So, so the, uh, because they are financially invested in it, uh, they maintain those structures. And yes, it is an effort. It's, it is an effort that has to be done if we are looking at sustainable source of water. And so connected with this statement, there is another question by another uh, participant, uh, Manish Jadda, who says how to approach community so they come with you for good cause. Uh, you know, he's sharing his own experience wherein he says that it is totally different. He feels that they do not rely on you considering you an, as an outsider. Also, he was keen to know that for how long water remains fresh or portable when collected in a tank from rainwater harvesting system. Uh, uh, I again uh, from my presentation, I am so sorry if I gave the impression that it is easy to get communities together. It is not. 
Uh, it sometimes takes a lot of time. Uh, some people understand quickly. Some people understand uh, understand uh, a little slowly. So we have uh, villages. There are a number of villages that we have wanted to take, but it takes at us nearly six months for them to be motivated and coming together. So obviously that is the reason why we said, whenever I said that our work is investing in the community and not the structure. So once we've invested in the community, uh, they understand the benefits. They also see uh, the, um, the benefit that has happened in a nearby village. So we do a lot of, as a part of our trainings, we do a lot of exposure visits. So when people see, uh, seeing is believing. And that's how it comes. So it's obviously um, a, a slow process. And I'm sorry, I missed the second part of the question. For how long the water remains fresh or portable when collected in a tank? So in a, in a water tank, in a water tank, rainwater remains fresh throughout the year. And like I mentioned, we have three aeration chambers. So the air is circulating. Because it is rainwater, uh, the catchment as well as the tank is clean before the rain. Uh, the water can last and be safe for a full year. I request Dr. Rajneesh Ranjan, you may please ask your query. I request again Dr. Rajneesh Ranjan, you may please ask your query. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Kanupriya, for your wonderful presentation. And I have two questions. One is related to groundwater pollution, uh, in, especially in Rajasthan, where you are working. Uh, my question is that what kind of you know intervention you are adopting for the assessment of the kind of groundwater pollution everywhere in Rajasthan? This is number one. I mean, there are so many kind of spatio-temporal variability of groundwater pollution. Some may be having, I, I came to know about the uranium pollution. Some may be having the iron pollution or like that. So, so one question is that how you are, you know, uh, adopting the intervention at the ground level. Second is that uh, related to disaster management, you know, you are directly dealing with the community participation. So what kind of capacity building interventions you are adopting for sensitizing people to have a developmental planning approach that may also address, you know, disasters like flooding or like drought situation or like other kind of disasters. As you may not be, uh, you know, uh, you, you can call the flood of because Barmer, Barmer flood was there due to unusual rainfall. So if, while working on the rainwater harvest at the same time, because you are a, a, a you know, a world famous organization. So what kind of intervention you, if you have adopting, you are adopting, can you let me know this? So uh, we're not directly working on groundwater pollution, but yes, uh, like I said, we test most the areas that we work in. We test uh, uh, the groundwater, um, the groundwater of that area, and we keep those reports. We also uh, do research programs as a part of our research uh, and advocacy. So we have partnered with uh, the Northwestern University, where we have uh, studied the pollution of the Luni River. Uh, this is a dry river, the only river that we have in Rajasthan. It flows only, um, only during the monsoon. So uh, we have studied the impact of uh, the impact of um, pollution on the groundwater from the tie and dye industry. Um, as far as uh, doing active implementation, um, our work focuses only on creating uh, rainwater harvesting structures mostly that are impounding. So ground, the water harvesting is of two types. One is uh, you know, groundwater recharge and the other is making impounding structures. We create impounding structures. So the active, the active uh, implementation by us is on uh, creating impounding structures that are used for drinking water. So we do not have any active intervention as far as groundwater pollution is concerned. Yes, when you talk about disaster management, uh, we do have training programs. We again have training programs with the government. I very well remember the Barmer flood of 2006. Uh, and I cannot, uh, in, in fact, very interestingly, in Rajasthan, in our area, people do not understand water. Uh, in Kavas, which was the most affected, when people were told that there is water coming uh, and there is a flood coming, they actually went and... Uh, 
went and slept on the second floor of their houses thinking that the water is not going to come in. So yes, there was a lot of de uh, devastation. So we do, uh, as a part of our training programs, uh, talk to them about disaster. Drought is a way of life for them. Um, so most of the agriculture that they do is subsistence. They first save for themselves and then they sell. Uh, the uh, provisioning of water, if I were to say through rainwater harvesting, again, uh, is uh, to mitigate the disaster of drought. By Miss, uh, by Dr. Veena Kanduri. Does um, she's asking is Jal Sansad an institutional and governance model of distributed governance um, in Rajasthan? How to sustain this model? Community contribution is highlighted, but is it enough for the sustainability of such program? Uh, so the Jal Sansad is not a pan Rajasthan. Um... Um, body. It is basically a, a community institution that we have done and we have created of all the villages who work with us. So basically, uh, we uh, we uh, uh, sit together and uh, the, we, these are villages that we work together. We sit down, we exchange ideas. So that is the Jal Sansa. It's not. It's a. It's an. It's a forum within the organization, if I were to say. Community contribution, uh, and the second question was about community contribution. Yes. So she's saying that is, do you think that this is the community contribution is the, the only thing required or is it enough for sustainability of such programs? Uh, so community contribution um, obviously um, ensures that uh, people maintain it. If you've spent something, if you've spent um, on the construction, if you've contributed, obviously there is an attachment. And uh, here we are talking about um, an asset which is giving them drinking water. So beside, uh, besides um, availability of, of water, they have actually also con they have they have contributed in the construction, which um, which then becomes uh, the reason for sustainability. Uh, I don't know whether this should this question should be uh, okay. I'll just take up the question. Kalupri, you may tell your comfort for the question. Dr. R. B. Singh Dupe. Um, I would like to put up some queries on saline water management in relation to crop water, uh, crop production in agriculture sector. What type of biological, chemical, and crop management uh, amelioration measures are needed in black cotton soils of central part of India? Um. Uh, I think this is a question probably <laughs> that the, oh, ministry, I... the ministry would be more. But in terms of us, uh, for in terms of our area, saline water is not used for agriculture. All our agriculture is rain fed. Okay. Um, so another one by Sayam. How important is community participation in protecting and restoring water-related ecosystems like river, lakes, etc.? Uh, it is very, very important if communities were to come together and to understand that they need to maintain their environment, they need to maintain their ecosystem. We are actually um, borrowing this from our future generations. Uh, there'll be a sea change. Okay. And um, Dr. Ka Dr. Kale, Watershed Organization Trust, um, is asking, as community has diverse social and resource groups, uh, will you throw some light on pointers to achieve the water management inclusive and no one is left aside? In background, gender gap in Rajasthan and other regions is huge. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, it is It is not easy. And as you said, that the gender gap in Rajasthan is, uh, uh, is huge. In fact, when I started working um, in the area, another anecdote that I would say, people used to tell me that I do not understand anything and I will not be able to do it because obviously it's a woman who's doing it. It's a slow process. Any consultative process is a slow process. Um, we spend time with the communities. Uh, we, uh, because uh, water is uh, something that is a requirement for everybody, it's a sm it's a slow and consultative process. It it doesn't happen overnight. We cannot go into a village and come back tomorrow with a broad based Jal Sabha. It doesn't happen. It is patience. 
Um, the next question is regarding the grievance cell. I think generally for every project and for every uh, you know um, state, there are generally uh, grievance cells. But still, representative from National Water Mission would like to uh, reply, Mr. Dixit, uh, or maybe Kanupriya, if you can add on to it. Uh, is there any mechanism where citizens can complain about institutions who are not working on groundwater reach or, or, or keeping negligence which can harm groundwater aquifers? Well, I can say for Rajasthan, we have a helpline number. Um, and uh, for water, I mean, the PhD has a helpline number. Every, anybody can call and log in a... Yeah, and I think this is the case with almost every state. Uh, they have their uh, helpline number. They have their uh, grievance itself. When one can um, uh, definitely put forward your uh, complaints and, and queries. Uh, okay, another one I'll take from Mr. John J. What is the way forward for them for women in rural areas who lack education but still wish to take part in rainwater harvesting? So it's actually, um, we have seen that once we've created a, a, a Jal Sabha, it is the women who are very, very active. Um, in fact, we have many Jal Sabhas where women are very active. They understand water. People understand. That it's, it's the space that has to be given. When you go into a village and you give them the space to speak, they speak. They speak. Uh, in, terms of a, in terms of a household tank, uh, it is always the woman who decides where the tank has to be made because she's the one who's using it. So it's, it's again, um, it is not something which will happen overnight. It's a, it's a gradual uh, change. Um, and yes, people then come together. Women come forward. And, they, and, and on many occasions, they're very, very vocal. I would not say everywhere. But yes, at least 30 to 40 percent places, very, very vocal. What challenges do you face? It's, it's a query by uh, Ms. Akansha. Uh, what challenges do you face while implementing policies and projects at ground level? Would you like to share any such case study while, while you, you faced the challenges and then overcame those challenges and implemented the projects? Oh, there are many. I mean, there, there, are, there are many. Like, uh, I, I would like to talk about uh, the, uh, when we started doing pricing of water. Uh, this is again um, the government of Rajasthan in its water policy um, had said that um, the, the people would be required to um, people would require to pay for the water. You know, so they basically the idea was to have a charge for water. So we wanted to, like I said, we we like to see how we can collaborate with the government. So we wanted to set up these pricing mechanisms in village in villages. So when we started off, this uh, this was uh, the water policy was in 2009-10 when we started and we started seeing of how to price um, water. When we first went, um, it, it was blasphemy that you know how can you take money for water? So the whole idea was that you're taking money for water, and uh, it was then that we realized that. Um, our communication was not right. You know, the communication has to be right, at least to begin with, when you're starting something. So then, uh, instead of saying that we were, uh, so the way they collect water from a common structure is that uh, there is a tractor tanker. The tractor tanker uh, has to be paid a certain amount of money to transport the water to the house. So then it struck us that why do we not say that this is actually the price of the tanker and not the water? So then we, uh, so even in my presentation, if you see, they, we say that for 50 rupees for 4,000 liter tanker. So we are not talking about water. So we changed our communication. So communication um, has to be something which the community understands. Um, it is within their social cultural menu. So it was not, pani ka paisa nahi le rahe hum, tanker ka paisa le rahe you know, the, so the communication changed. So, and then it became easier to spread the message of, charging for water for uh, maintaining those structures. That's true. So communication plays a very important role, how it is communicated. And that's why, uh, you know, special IC strategies are formed whenever any such programs are taken up. Um, another one by Ayushi, where do you citizen, where do citizens stand on initiating a dialogue on the uneven distribution of drinking water? 
Well, again, I think that is something that the, the ministry will have to answer because uh, uh, uneven distribution of water, yes. I mean, in fact, our uh, when we talk about our water pricing, it is also regressive, uh, even though I, um, um, so, so I guess it is more initiatives like this, Anupma ji, that you would have to do to create a dialogue on uh, probably the right to water and the, uh, the inequity in water. So I think for that also ownership lies on each one of us as well, because if you see that, uh, you know, it has different, even the billing, the bills, water bills, which we generally get, if every individual has a different meaning of it. For, yeah. for somebody maybe of HIG or MIG, it may be just a bill which needs to be paid. For others, it will be something very important, maybe something, you know, they, they really feel that, you know, next two months we'll be getting it. So every individual has the ownership to understand what value they place on water. So every drop needs to be conserved at individual level, at institution level. And of course, there are support from various organizations like Jal Bhagavad Foundation and many more, which we have uh, 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 we have seen in the past, as, as well as we'll be looking forward to hear more in the future water talk and tech talk period. Um, um, so I think with this, we come to an end of all our queries. I think I have taken almost all the queries. And still, if there are any, uh, and you would like to put forward to Ms. Kanupriya, even in future, you can write to us or you can write to National Water Mission and uh, all your queries will be answered. Um, as I have always spoken in the uh, water talk that all your queries are always placed on the website in the FAQ section of uh, uh, National Water Mission's website. So if you have anything which which you want to question, you would, which you want to ask our speaker or National Water Mission, you can always write to us or can write directly to National Water Mission. So thank you so much, Kanupriya. We are uh, getting a lot of compliments for your, uh, in fact, there are a lot of compliments. You can read them in the chat box also for the wonderful work and the way you have presented it and shared. Uh, Devushri ma'am uh, had had to leave for some uh, unavoidable work. So maybe uh, uh, we have Mr. Dixit on behalf of National Water Mission who will be placing the thank you note. So over to you, Mr. Dixit. Good evening, everyone. I am SM Dixit, advisor technical from National Water Mission. The talk delivered by the Ms. Kanupriya Hari, the executive director, Jal Bhagirati Foundation, was very informative and way you have garnered the support of the huge public was tremendous. After Thank listening to the talk, it is clear that how hard and the tremendous efforts have been made by the team of the Jal Bhagirati Foundation in one of the most water stressed part of the country to, uh, uh, to transform it by the way of constructing the Talab, Nadi, Nahar, school tankas, household tankas, vary and the sand dens. The approach of the community mobilization, reviving the traditional participatory action research, have played the vital role in enhancing the resilience to the climate change. Further, the work carried out by the Bhagirati Foundation is just not limited to the water conservation, but is also transforming the lives of the people of that region. The creation of the Jal Sabha, Jal Samiti, Jal Parishad, and Jal Sansad is also very thoughtful approach to keep the people together and develop of a sense of responsibility among them. Thank you, Madam, for sharing your learned experience and knowledge with us and lack of the audience who have joined us at this time or may see this through our YouTube channel in future. Finally, I would like to thank all of our viewers who have joined us through the various platform and I am confident that these viewers will further disseminate the information information gained from this talk. Thank you once again. Over to you, Anupamati. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mr. Diksha. Thank you, Mr. Anupriya. And thank you all our participants. You know, you see yourself, the, the talks are so interactive that you really enjoy. You feel that, yes, whatever has been presented, there are so many queries coming up. People are wanting to know more, interacting more. So we really look forward to your participation. I'm glad to share. I, I would again like to highlight this was 37th water talk, which means almost, you know, almost three years. So, so uh, it's, it's good to see that even during the virtual, the virtual world has given us a chance to connect with people from far across places. 
and like uh, Kanupriya is delivering her talk from Rajasthan and there are many who have been delivering from various parts of India as well as um, across the world, from across the world. So we look forward to your participation. Keep supporting, keep contributing and make this water talk and tech talk more popular in the coming time. Okay, thank you so much and thank you so much to National thank Water you. Mission also for giving Water Digest the opportunity to contribute. Thank you everyone. Do take care. We'll see you again in the water talk and tech talk next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.